hi guys. Um, so today I'll be talking about my research projects leveraging open data in agriculture. So it was it's quite a very interesting experience um, working on this with um, youth members and some other collabor collaborators that were able to like foster in the process of achieving this. It was in the process of this, it actually uh, because so much understanding about agriculture, although I know um, it's quite a very huge thematic area, um, but in the process of this, we actually made a lot of sense and we were actually able to collect data. So next slide, um, Dara. So basically these, uh, it's actually right into four section um, what function is about, I'm just gonna briefly talk about it, um, the team, the research team that actually worked on this, some of the process, and I'm going to do live feed, a live demo because uh, we we're able to create a web portal where the where our project was actually um, stored, most of the information we got in the process. So next slide. All right, so um, farm sense. So basically, the idea behind farm sense was to be able to create open data that could actually foster agriculture. Because on doing this, on working this project, one thing that we understood or we actually found was the fact that there wasn't open data for agriculture. It it was quite interesting because um, there were a lot of data out there, but when it comes to agriculture, about what area of this farm is farming cassava, maize, rice, those information was not available and when, by doing, when we're doing our literature reviews and stuff for this project, we realized that this information was actually required and needed by a lot of stakeholders, both people from the supply chain and even the farmer himself, but it, will, it wasn't available. So it become, it, it become like a challenge because um, we, we talk about agriculture so much, but we don't really know who is doing what, who is planting what, what, what agricultural practice is being done in what part of the country, what part of, what, what part of this area actually get this uh, agriculture. Yeah, there was a large research done by looking at land use coverage, but the data itself was not available. So we wanted to be able to bridge that, which is something we started working on in um, as farm sense. Um, next. So the team was myself on uh, Akonde Adeoluwa. So I currently work as a data a data specialist for integration, and I also consult with uh, Predictive Insight. That is as a data scientist. Um, Adeolu is a doctor in in Nova Ims um, Lisbon. I forgot the name because it's actually in Portuguese. So, but in in Portugal, and is currently a data scientist at Bookings. So. We, my Stefan, okay, Adeolu and I, we actually worked on this project and it was very helpful because he actually provided me with a lot of help um, as, we, as regards, you know, providing me with adequate resources to, to get to and coming up with ideas on how to be able to like best deliver this project. So yeah, so this was actually the team that was involved. So next. Well, so the process methodology was quite interesting because um, some part of this project actually was very very difficult in implementing and one of them was stakeholder collaboration well amazing enough there was so much um there were a lot of stakeholders involved in our cultural chain um before i actually went into this project i never actually knew it was that much and how rigid it could be because um, we had to go back and forth to be able to like make sure we meet all the necessary stakeholders which include from the community head to a government, a government, okay, the government, the local government chairman, which actually is supposed to be able to, that is in charge of the community as well. So it was very problematic. And sometimes we try to make collaboration with some existing organization that's working on this project. It was quite problematic because we had to go back and forth in this process. And it takes a lot of time, weeks, um, sometimes they don't get to respond to us and when they do, they actually ask to ask for some tokens and stuff. But it was actually a nice experience because we, we actually understood at the end of this project that stakeholders engagement is actually very key for this because um, they, looking at the resilience for agriculture, we have to be able to like make sure all the stakeholders actually come in a round table to discuss about how to move forward, which includes the 
post-processing the farmers, the government, some some collaborators, organizations that's interested in improving agriculture in, in the community as well. So it was quite an interesting um, um, experience using the stakeholders um, collaboration because yeah, I actually wrote a lot of mails, you know, writing documents, signing them, and going back to back and forth to a different organization to be able to like, okay, this is what's going on. Can I can we come to have some discussion? So it was quite interesting. And then we have the project planning and coordination. Um, this was quite interesting because you have to look for the right people for the job. You have to be able to look for a nice team because you start to understand that you can't do it alone. So um, you have to be able to like go back and forth with um, with processes as well to make it so stimulus, which is where EAD Africa actually came in and they were very, very helpful because they actually had so much experience in leveraging their understanding in collecting data as well. So they actually guide me so much in this process. And then we have the field deployment. So this area, this part of it was quite interesting because ideally you're trying to come up with the schematic in your head on how everything is gonna play, um, which was quite, very, very much um, a challenge for me because um, it was actually the first time I'm actually working on such intensive project, but it became more interesting because um, during the stakeholders collaboration and engagement, that's actually where you start starting to understand what was actually the need for the farmer, what sort of data that you want to collect. So it was very helpful, the stakeholder engagement. So. Um, so when the field deployment started, which includes you know coming up with surveys, questions, and deploying it and creating questionnaires in um, mobile formats, so that was actually very very interesting because uh, you know you get to start building um, surveys using XLS form and then deploy it on um, aggregate server like ODK or probably Ona or maybe Kobo Tubos as well. So it was quite um, a journey. And then the community engagement, yeah, well. I actually had a lot of meetings. I never knew I could, but I actually did because you need to be able to have everyone on board. You need to be able to like have everyone to be on the same picture or on the same page with you. And yeah, that was actually very fun because uh, you even had to attend some meetings, some local meetings. Although some place there was like some conversation on language barriers because um, Nigeria actually have 256 languages, and I actually speak just two, which was uh, which was actually interesting because where I actually was in working was actually speaking Yoruba, and I don't speak Yoruba, so you have to like work with some other guys that understand Yoruba just to be able to like you know get to to communicate with them very much, and the return for data collection. So this was needed, so we should be able to know and understand how the, the data collector actually working and if they're actually collecting the right data and actually getting the point. So I actually got this understanding and knowledge from EOT Africa because they de deployed some, some nice infrastructure to be able to monitor um, field data collector. So, which was very, very helpful because more than ever, we're actually looking into the quality of the data. So yeah, that was actually, uh, and then we have the database. So basically, we needed to house the data we collected, and we created a database for that. And yeah, the data was cleaned afterwards. It was processed. The validation was done. And then um, I and some other guys actually have to go back to resurface some site to make sure the points of the data they collected was actually the right one. And finally, we developed a platform, which was quite interesting. And actually, it was fun in the process as well. Yes, Dan. Yeah, on creating, no, um, go back a bit. On creating the, um, the field survey, so basically it was, so our primary data collection source was Kobo, Kobo Collect, and the aggregate server we used was Ona. Uh, we wanted to use Kobo Tupos, uh, Kobo Aggregate, but um, I, Ona was actually quite effective as well. And the data we actually got was, uh, we actually converted to Excel, and then we studied in Google Sheets, and then from there, 
we actually put it in the web UI, which then we worked with the jQuery data tables and the leaflet to be able to deploy the map. And then we did some visualization using Google Data Studio because we're trying to be all open source. So we have to like, you know, deploy all the open source technology that I actually understood at the time of this research. Um, yeah, next. Uh, well, so this is a picture of when we were at the farm. It was quite fun because, um, uh, yeah, it was quite fun because, um, yeah, feed data collection was fun, but it was very stressful because you the the, the length of okay the, the the length of distance that I got to walk in the process was quite was quite interesting. I, I don't think I've ever walked that far before because um, we actually have to go like so hard to reach um, community because the farms are not actually in, in in the town per se. So you have to go to villages, you know, and like you have to jump into a motorcycle and they they take you somewhere and then you have to walk inside. Um, sometimes you don't even know where you are. Sometimes you don't have network connection, but, but it was fun because um, I, I, I at that time, you got to understand more about um, what the agricultural situation was in, at that time of doing the research, which was very, very fun. And I actually, actually enjoyed it. Um, so next. Well, so for, for this demo, um, uh, I, I, will, I will have to um, present using my screen. So I'm just going to do it right now. Um, so yep, yep. So this is so this is the portal. So it's farmsense.ng. Pretty much, um, it has quite some resources to get started in agricultural farming, which uh, includes some important information, plan you may have to drive to start, etc. So it actually has some information about that. And then it talks about the stakeholders involved. You have government, you have agribusiness and everything. So these are the data available in the world portal. Like data we collected, we have, we're able to map 21 farms, 22 farms. Uh, the market was about 145 and the water point we found was like 22. And this, uh, so this was supposed to be some, you know, best practices on farming agriculture. And then more about what the project was about or where we're trying to take the project to. And this was the team that actually helped in developing the software and stuff. And yeah, so FarmSense started by seven project that, that was enlisted for the Youth Mappers project, which was um, the George Washington University was funded by United States Agency for International Development. So if you really want to know more about it, um, this is actually everything, all the information we have is actually here. So we have the background, project goals and stuff. And then we developed some interesting dashboard just to be able to visualize what we've done so far. So we have the number of female, we have 167 was male, um, 52 was female. Most of them was involved in co continuous farming which was quite which was quite which i actually i wasn't surprised per se because you know the land acquired land was a little bit problematic so they just have to get use what they have which was you know continue farming the land and only few actually do miss farming so we have the age group so surprisingly i was really surprised about this because we, we we've got that 29 to 28 years old which was quite interesting because I was actually thinking the age group would be between 49 because I didn't know a lot of youth was still um, in agricultural production. So which was quite interesting. And the metadata, so this data set was last updated in January 2019 and some of the instruction about it. And then we have the data portal, so which is this. So these are some of the data that we collected. So we have uh, Ibaroke in Ondo State, Federal is age 35, farm size 15 by 50. Well, so this this was some of the 
some of the delivery also you could actually check the area map just to see where it's falling into and you go down a little bit you can see and then street map i think you could easily split this into just the map instead or you want to look at the data table so this was actually fun like i actually enjoyed myself while i was working on this project and and honestly it actually was the start so one of the projects that I worked on that actually is put me in a very good position in starting my career. So yeah, um, I think I don't know, I think that's the end of my slide. Um Dara, do you want to display the last slide? Yeah, um I think that's about it for my my research. Um leveraging open data in agriculture. So yeah, I've actually learned a lot and some lesson was learned and I also understood more that um, basically the, what we think is a problem with agriculture is not actually what it is. Um, and most mostly the challenges was, you know, access and access to the right markets. So they they actually feel really bad about how the agriculture product has been um, it's been appreciated in in this part in this part of the community where I actually did the survey because of the their crops and their goods are not well are not well priced and most of the time they have no other option than to sell it and which becomes very problematic for them because the money they actually for for go or the money they actually foresee they want to sell it for is most most of the time not the money so because of that it gives them some like they're always in debt and they don't really make the best out of the money they actually got because it's not well valued now. and because this has actually been done very well because of the inadequate storage facility which was very much the case and yeah the middleman was also part of playing the role because they actually buy this stuff from the farmers in a very very small price and they sell it for higher price and then the access to road was very very terrible so so yeah they had they actually have a lot of problem because what the government actually focused more is using improved tools to farm but the main issues are not yet addressed and which is you know providing readily available market for this farmer and you know that's a weather facility as well especially storage facility yeah so pretty much that was it for Farm sense, and I'm very glad I had the opportunity to talk about it. And thanks, Tara. Thanks, Tara. Thanks to you, Papas, for this opportunity to talk about it. Yep. In case you have any question. Thanks so much, Dennis. Um, we're yeah, we're gonna move to the next presentation. So I'll move the slides. And we'll have a um, question and answer session at the end. So go ahead, Karin. Hello. So today I'm going to talk about an idea I had shared with my recent boss. Uh, uh, she was so happy that I want to uh, work. Uh, I want to work. Uh, with OpenStreetMap and she, uh, economic development planning. So I am going to share uh, with you all about the idea. Uh, so uh, there are next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the uh, connection between OpenStreetMap data and economic de development. How we can just like um, use OpenStreetMap data in open uh, economic development planning. So OpenStreetMap data is actually publicly available data. So you can use or download or share it free of course. And economic development is something a process to expanding your job location, uh, your job, your wealth or your quality of life. So I am going to talk about geography, economics, design and planning because these four topic is more connected to the available of data uh, in OpenStreetMap. So 
in OpenStreetMap, you will find some data connected to the location, some kind of amenities. That uh, then uh, you you will have some data like uh, land use uh, land use style. So you can easily use this data in uh, locating your uh, developing uh, economics and will design some plan for further use. Next slide, please. Yeah. So, what we have in OpenStreetMap data, land information, or what kind of the use of land, or we can also see the amenities data. Like we have, uh, uh, we have hospitals, school, colleges, marketplaces, or bank. Uh, that would be the service for people, right? So. We can use this data to measure the economic condition of a specific area. Like, uh, if we want to like focus on a commercial area, we'll find uh, like more uh, services uh, available for the people. Then we can cal calculate the amenities and identify the hub of economical growth. So, how we can process this data? We will have a tool. We will need a tool, right? So. GIS technology will be that tool to decision support and like to play a vital role in processing the data, which is actually uh, extracted from Wilson. It will create a link between the data and the processing thing so that we can understand the economic condition of a, of a particular area, area, then we can just like, uh, we can just uh, uh, we can just understand the economic condition of this area and then we can analyze the data for further planning. So eco uh, how we can use this OpenStreetMap data and GIS in economic development? We can analyze this data to show the economic condition of particular area. Basically, um, we, ha we will have the data from census or uh, budget, but that actually for the whole country. But if we want to focus on city or a small area, then we, uh, then we actually don't have that much data for a specific area. How we can just uh, compare city to city or how we can just compare uh, place to place uh, uh, inside of a country. So that thing gonna be, uh, gonna be helped by Western data to compare city to city's data and then to model our economic development planning. Then we can have a proper plan for uh, further research or further use or anything else. Next. Okay. Now this, uh, I am just going to explain the bridge between WSM and GIS to analyze economic development. So suppose I am showing you that WSM, uh, WSM layer of a uh, commercial hub in Dhaka, and I have extracted this data in ArcGIS. Now you can see that there, there is an option where there is some point feature, some polygon feature, and some line feature. I, I can use it according to my purpose, like I want to show the job location, or I want to show the bank location, or I, I want to show the actual scenario of their uh, lifestyle. Now, there would be some restaurant, or there would be some, um, uh, some kind of playground, so that uh, they have some, they have uh, some, uh, so we can just, identify their quality of life. Then uh, then we can compare it with the different area. Like I am showing here a commercial hub. We can just compare it with the residential hub in inside of Dhaka, as capital of Bangladesh. So, so you can just understand the differences between the cities, the different services people getting from, uh, from government or non-government uh, organization or anything else. So next slide. Okay, here is the 
table view of that data. You can see that there, there is uh, some land, uh, land use information. If this is a building, what type of building that is, university, commercial, or school, you can easily identify that amenities, or you can have that park, playground. So with that, what I was saying the last slide, we can actually compare the standard of living between two different areas. And actually we can input this data for further research. Like uh, we can predict the urban sprawl. And then we, uh, if we, I want to, uh, if I want to uh, like start a new business, what location would be perfect for me? What location would be perfect for the customers? Or what location would be perfect for uh, my product sharing? That that thing can be easily easily extracted from that data and you can actually identify it by yourself sitting in your home you don't need to buy any data you need to um, analyze the census or you need, need not to like um, uh, talk to expert or something else you can just like you can just have this data, you can just use it as a uh, GIS tool, then you will understand how it going to be perfect location for your business or for your um, for your standard of living. You can choose a place to stay or you can choose an economically developed place for your further, um, further staying or further living. So it will be easy for you. Next slide, Dara. Okay. How can the impact of OpenStreetMap data in developing economic space can be captured? Well, I'm sh showing you a model. Uh, actually, it's not a model. I'm just, uh, I'm just like showing you my idea with a flow or with a process. Firstly. We, we should have an input like uh, OpenStreetMap data that is that is analyzed by, or leveraged by both government and non-government actor. Actor means uh, the person or the organization that uh, that uh, will use this data to uh, to develop people lives or to enable. Uh, 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 to in, uh, improve the condition of people, uh, people uh, living, or uh, they can create economic opportunity, or they can uh, solve social platform, anything else. And uh, output will be some kind of policies or some kind of um, presentation, advocacy that would help to plan economic development. Next slide. So this is actually the elaboration of previous slide. So here input would be like OpenStreetMap data, GIS data, statistical data, administrative data, financial data, and we can just compile this data and the actors who gonna use this data will show us the action, the data analysis, the aggregation, the the mashup or visualization and it will be output of map or dashboard or data driven infograph or policies or advocacy anything else so it is a process you will input some data there will be someone who wanna grab this data and they will just analyze and there will be output which is the economic development planning or policies or advocacy that gonna help to uh, develop economically uh, next okay what would be the impact okay the impact would be uh, actually this is what i am thinking what can be the impacts are uh, it will be like service facility you will have improved service facilities you will have increased information share, sharing or empowering the citizen or social mobilization or job creation or it can be like something economic growth or it can be some expand of business or something big like 
you can just use this data uh, in a process then you can plan and design for your development for policy making anything anything you can do it but just you have to choose how you use this data i am showing you here with a table which is has what kind of problem we have what kind of capacity and culture we have and then what kind of governance will be needed here and partnership and then you will get these impacts after all this collaboration this impact will be here for us so next slide so in a nutshell i want to uh, i want to just share my idea with you guys to get some uh, some advices or suggestion because I, uh, because this is a new idea for me i want to i want to act, i actually want to you know, do research on this topic so i'm here uh, presenting this topic because i i want to get the suggestion uh, for this um, for this topic so that i can continue my research thank you thank you everyone so i'm i just ended my presentation here Tara. thank you irene uh michael you can go ahead and start and remember everyone feel free to put your questions in the chat okay so I will be presenting the, my, my research project, uh, Volunteer Geographic Information and Machine Learning to Map System Maximizes uh, Transmission in, uh, Risk in Senegal. Uh, actually, you can see that I copied and pasted my master course uh, slides. They were like 70, but now they are only 69. So you are lucky. No, I'm joking. So uh, next slide. So this uh, research project uh, actually is a long story because uh, uh, the research group working in Politecnico di Milano led by Professor uh, Renato Casagrandi and, uh, and uh, the doctor uh, um, Lorenzo Mari um, uh, called the Mapping Schistosomysis Transmission Risk in San Luis, Senegal, uh, Master Salesse, uh, was awarded in 2016 of the Polysocial Award, which is a, an award in my university for social responsibility and development. So uh, the goal of the research project is to uh, try to reduce at minimum, a minimum the, the impact of the uh, area of uh, schistosomiasis, uh, um, schistosomiasis transmission, uh, producing risk maps uh, in Senegal River Valley. And I worked uh, to, uh, together with Fabio Cattaneo, a colleague of mine, uh, to uh, reach the, uh, those, goal, those goals. Uh, next slide. So speaking about uh, schistosomiasis, uh, schistosomiasis is a neglected tropical disease. This means that uh, uh, this disease is uh, still present in poor places of the world, like in Africa and in Asia, but it has been eradicated in uh, richer places like Europe and USA. Uh, the, the schistosomiasis is uh, second uh, to malaria in terms of prevalence, uh, as it globally affects one billion people uh, all around the world. Uh, this doesn't mean that everyone has a schistosomiasis, but uh, they are sus susceptible. And uh, also, um, okay, the, the, I mean, the schistosomiasis is following a complex ecological cycle in which uh, uh, the parasite, which is the schistosoma, is living in the form of Miracidia inside the water. Uh, this uh, Miracidia is attacking a, an intermediate host, which, which are the snails uh, of the species beyond Falaria that they are typically living in uh, small lakes, in salt lakes. Uh, and then this, uh, this parasite is growing inside the snails and the, it's coming out in the form of, uh, uh, of, um, of Cercaria. And uh, this Cercaria is uh, strong enough to attack uh, humans. And it is only needed the contact with, uh, with the water and the skin to, to get uh, infected by this parasite. So this parasite is entering the human body and uh, growing, uh, um, producing uh, and growing in the form of a worm and uh, uh, causing uh, uh, urogenital diseases and also mental diseases and impairment uh, to kids. And after this, uh, humans are releasing the waste water in the, in the natural water. And so the cycle is uh, continuing uh, with uh, the Miracidia growing up and attacking snails and then attacking again uh, humans. Next slide. So, um, 
this problem is twofold because we can think about uh, humans and so um, you see if you if we don't know where humans are living also uh, I mean in terms of mapping of villages we cannot help anybody in a uh, rescuing uh, from, from this uh, disease and also um, and also we cannot uh, do capacity building with uh, local population and letting them know about the risks of this uh, of this uh, um, disease next slide and also uh, another as aspect of this uh, problem is uh, uh, on the environmental side because uh, we we know from scientific research that these snails uh, living in the water and uh, being the the middle point in this uh, disease transmission uh, live uh, together with uh, have a strong interspecific relation with uh, tifa species and aquatic vegetation and this is uh, like a reed the reed that you can find in ponds and these snails are living uh, mostly in uh, these in these uh, ponds i mean in the ponds with this aquatic veg vegetation so if we know where this aquatic vegeta vegetation is we can also understand the uh, the risk areas for uh, the disease transmission indeed if we have no snails we don't have even uh, schistosomiasis next slide so to map villages what we did is to uh, host uh, many many uh, social gatherings and mapathons uh, with our uh, youth mapper chapter uh, which was a uh, which we, which is polymappers and also with the collaboration of the youth mappers team in uh, in UGB, which is the Université Gaston Berger in Saint Louis, Saint Louis a region, a region of Senegal, um, together with the with the help of the president uh, Ibrahim Soria which is following us uh, uh, now, I think. And uh, also we collaborated with the uh, African Institute of, of Mathematical Sciences and uh, um, with Dr. Uh, Amadou Lamin Touré. Uh, as you see, we organized a cross-continental mapathon uh, between Italy, Senegal, and, main, and also South America, some people from South America, from Asia. So they, we hosted this uh, web mapathon and we mapped it all together. And I was in Politecnico di Milano together with Lorenzo Mari and uh, Fabio Cattaneo was in, uh, in Senegal with the UGB team in, uh, and Renato Casagrandi uh, in, uh, in the university. And also Do Dr. Amadou Lamin Touré was in, uh, in uh, the African Institute of Mathematical Sciences. Then we hosted many, many different uh, social events and we actually we started the project in the state of the map 2018. And uh, we also hosted the uh, Nuit de la Geographie uh, from Cartong uh, and uh, BC Maps. Next slide. So uh, to compute this data, so the data we, we produced with our mapping campaigns, we wrote some scripts in Python and they are parsing XML files from planet.osm to search the chain sets in OpenStreetMap in such a way that we can uh, know which user has produced which uh, geometric uh, feature because then we were also parsing the data from uh, Geofabric the, the server in which you can find uh, the geometric features. And so we were coupling geometric features and uh, uh, user contribution in order to know uh, which uh, user contributed which feature uh, at which point in time. So uh, this is, these are the results. On the left, you can see the map of uh, a focus uh, on the Saint Louis region in Senegal. And the black uh, polygons are the houses and the buildings present before our intervention. And then you see the red ones are the, uh, one, the buildings uh, uh, that all the contributors uh, added. And the contributors at the end of the mapping campaign were like uh, 250 more or less. Um, on, on the right, you can see a plot of the, of the statistics uh, of the mapped buildings. We mapped uh, a, a total of two, two 23,000 buildings in Senegal with an increase of the 9% uh, uh, with respect to the previous situation and also uh, many buildings in Saint Louis uh, with an increase of the 33% of all the buildings that were present in the region. Um, and also in the, in the plot you can see that uh, where we were hosting the main events uh, actually most of the contribution were, were happening. So uh, at the state of the map, uh, 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 with the cross-continental mapathon, uh, uh, with other events at the local universities uh, or uh, at La Nuit de la Geographie 
or in another, another event with the universe. So you see, and all other uh, increases and the slope of this plot is uh, uh, basically uh, due to the open source uh, nature of the project, so everyone uh, uh, could contribute to the PCHOS project we, we open it. Uh, next slide. Of all this data, we also checked uh, um, like the user uh, classification. So we were checking the, uh, how the users were uh, contributing. So we separated two classes of users. So one class is uh, the newcomers. The newcomers are basically the users that are contributing their first chain set in our mapping campaign. So they are approaching OpenSeedMap the first time with us. And uh, as you see, the contributions of the uh, newcomers aren't uh, so, so big. Uh, they map the few, few buildings like 300, 3,000, sorry. Um, and also we mapped the, the we plotted the, the frequency, the relative frequency of uh, changes per uh, each user. So uh, as you can see, this, uh, this distribution is uh, uh, very skewed on, on the right. So uh, you see that um, many, many contributors are mapping few buildings, while a few contributors are mapping the most. So we thought maybe we can also classify the power mappers. And the power mappers, uh, yes, basically they are outliers of this distribution on the on the right tape. So uh, to understand who is the outlier, we basically took the the box whisker plot and uh, we weighted it for the um, for uh, taking into account that this distribution is not symmetrical. No, and so uh, at the end of the day, we found the two power mappers that are those two points uh, on the bottom right uh, in the plot in the bottom right. Uh, and these two plots, uh, the, these two points uh, were uh, the contributors, and we checked uh, their contribution, and they produced like uh, yes, eight thousand buildings alone. All, all, only those two guys are <laughs> were producing two uh, eight thousand buildings alone. Uh, next slide. And yes, and basically, okay, this this uh, aspect is all, is common in OpenSea map, but on, not only uh, in OpenSea map, but in general, all uh, the citizen science projects. Uh, and we saw also that the the same distribution is uh, applying uh, both to the users, normal users, and the newcomers. So also the newcomers were following this distribution. Uh, okay, talking about this slide, uh, we. Um, then conduced a, a ground truth retrieval campaign to know uh, where the vegetation is and to acquire multispectral uh, data about this vegetation in order to train uh, machine learning algorithms to uh, understand where this vegetation is in uh, satellite imagery. So actually, um, we went there in March, March April 2019. Um, and we went there only with this map. This map was pro provided by a local uh, company there, Geomatica. Um, and this, uh, this data comes from a survey with drones. So they simply uh, mapped the, the area in which they saw TIFA. So next slide. So here are the, uh, some photos of our mapping campaign. We were uh, going around with this pickup in uh, St. Louis and together with Ibrahim, as you can see in the, in the photo, Fabio and, and Lamin. And also we were also engaging with the local communities and the people living in, in the villages and they were uh, checking the drone and also the kids were so happy. Uh, then, okay, we had also some technical issues. The drone was falling down into the, into the swamp and we, are, we were retrieving it, uh, like cutting the, the teeth and swimming with crocodiles or something like this. Uh, and well, okay, then we also met the local chapter of uh, youth mappers, the UGB youth mappers, and we uh, played with the drone inside the university. Next slide. For the machine learning part, I will skip a lot of details, uh, like the resolution of the images, the multispectral bands that we uh, add, um, but I will explain a, a little bit the procedure. So. We added this uh, drone imagery of uh, TIFA places. Then uh, we mapped, <laughs> because we are youth mappers, so we mapped the, 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 like, where the, the polygons in which TIFA is present. Uh, in this case, you see uh, all, the, all, all the aquatic vegetation here was TIFA. 
And then with a k-means procedure, so with an algorithm, we divided the, the, the data into training and validation uh, based on the position of the pixel, simply to have two different training and validation sets. Uh, then we applied two different uh, machine learning algorithms, which are uh, logistic regression and uh, uh, random forest, even if here I put a decision tree, but I won't uh, go into the details, so we can go to the next slide. And basically what we saw is that uh, there is some difference in the in uh, easy cases and uh, difficult cases, because uh, as you can see in this photo in which we have only TIFA, uh, both the algorithms are able to classify all the vegetation, so all the pixels are ca classified as TIFA in this photo. While uh, in the uh, next uh, slide, we have an example with diversified aquatic vegetation. So we went in a place in which uh, TIFA was present only in few spots. And uh, as you can see here, uh, logistic regression is having many problems. You cannot understand where is, uh, the, the, where is the aquatic vegetation we were searching for. But in, uh, in uh, random forest, in this case, was able also to check the other, uh, the other set uh, that uh, wasn't used for the, for the training. So uh, one spot was used for the training and the other one was uh, in validation. And as you can see, the results are pretty good uh, with this one. Next slide. And at the end, we applied uh, these models trained on drone imagery to uh, satellite uh, aerial imagery. Uh, actually, I won't spend here details about uh, the, the um, uh, meteorological correction, like the correction of uh, what water vapor and so on. But uh, anyway, uh, we saw that the two models are behaving uh, very strangely in, the, in these photos, even because it's a difficult, uh, difficult uh, task to, to reach, I mean, to, to train a model on, drain, on drone images and then apply, apply them in, uh, in satellite images. But uh, you see, in some cases, the logistic regression is, is finding uh, TIFA uh, around, the, around the rivers and also random forests. But in many cases, we saw that uh, they were simply putting pixels uh, at random here and there. So there are also some bad results. And actually, we are continuing this uh, research project. I mean, uh, as I told you, it's a never-ending story. So um, from 2016 up to now, and now we stopped with uh, COVID because, you know, with COVID, we cannot do uh, much. But uh, yes, we are planning to continue this, uh, this project and to produce an epidemiological model that uses this data, this classification of TIFA to produce uh, uh, risk transmission uh, maps for schistosomiasis and uh, also maybe trying some more sophisticated uh, uh, machine learning algorithms like uh, deep, uh, deep learning, for example, like uh, convolution neural net. Um, and that's it. I never published uh, these results, and uh, yes, I hope to do it uh, uh, in the next year. Uh, COVID, uh, I mean, with hoping that COVID will not stop uh, stop us to do so. Thank you. Thanks so much, so much, Michael and Ingrid. You can go ahead and start. Yes. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about the study or research which has carried out in one of the refugee settlements here in Uganda. So um, next slide. Um, Chakati Refugee Settlement is was a study area and it's found in Western Uganda in Chagagwa district. It has refugees from Burundi, the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Rwanda, and it consists of nine zones. So um, at the height of the refugee crisis between 2016 and 2018 in Uganda, Chakati Refugee Settlement received very many refugees and asylum seekers. Um, next slide, Dara. Um, so for sustained resilience, these individuals require access to social services, um, such as education, health, water, and sanitation facilities. Whereas these facilities have been provided, it is questionable whether they are adequately accessible to promote resilience amongst refugees in this settlement. Also, conversely, given the fact that refugee settlements are characterized by limited resources, refugees tend to heavily rely on the environment for resources such as food, for energy, and for building their houses, which can be detrimental to the environment in the long run and if left unchecked. So the research mainly looked at 
it was a, it aimed at assessing the, the accessibility of education, health, food, and sanitation facilities, as well as assess the land cover dynamics within Chakati refugee settlement. However, I will not dwell very much on the third objective, the third specific objective, because it is out of scope for this webinar. I'll only look at the first two specific objectives. Um, next slide, Dara. So the methodology, um, it, we had a remote mapping exercise. A task was created on the humanitarian open strip map um, team's task manager. We identified a team of remote mappers who mapped all the roads and the buildings within the refugee settlement. And then we also had a field mapping exercise. But before this field mapping exercise, we had a reconnaissance trip to the settlement where we met with a camp commandant. Um, we sort of wanted to get the lay of the land, wanted to see how we're going to plan our logistics. And then later we had the we had a training and then finally carried out the field mapping. So the field mapping was carried out using Hobo Collect and field papers and OSM and and WhatsApp was used for communication as the um, the participants went out and collected the data. Um, the data which was collected included education facilities, water facilities, sanitation facilities, and health facilities. This data was cleaned, it was validated, it was uploaded to OSM. We received very many comments from the OSM community, which we um, tended to make sure that all the data that we uploaded was in line with the OSM tagging system. Then this data was later used for network analysis, user analysis, and multi criteria evaluation. Um, next slide, Dara. So this is just a gallery of um, the activities that were carried out. This was during the training. So we received a very big number of refugees who are very um, interested in learning how to use a smartphone to collect data. And when we inquired why that was the case, they mentioned that this is a skill that is very marketable for them because very many NGOs also have field data collection activities. So we did receive a very huge number, but we're only able to work with 10 of them. Next slide, Dara. Yeah, so um, the team was properly trained. They were equipped with everything that they needed. The phones were set up and they went out and collected the data. So at the end of each day, we met at a central point where we made sure that all the data that was collected in the field was uploaded to the Kobo server. This data was later cleaned and then uploaded to OSM as well. Um, next slide. So moving on to the results, um, this is, um, doesn't seem like, okay. So um, according to the UNHCR, okay, our water points should be at a distance of 200 meters in a safe and secure location. So service areas of 200 meters from the water points were determined and we realized that only 31% of the dwellings within the refugee settlement were within the service area. And what this means is people have to walk longer distances to get access to water. And since this task is usually the obligation of women and children, this puts them at a bigger risk. And also um, from some of the interactions that we had in the interviews, we found out that children spend a lot of time collecting water, which affects their ability to attend school. Um, some solutions have been put in place in the refugee settlement, such as water tracking, um, but this does not happen very often. Water tracking is basically moving water from one point to another, to the areas where there is no water, but this doesn't happen very often. Um, in as much as proximity <coughs> to water points is very important, there are other factors that have to be taken into consideration, such as the nature of the water points, the functionality, flooding and cost. So we realized that out of all the water points that we collected, 20% were man-made and 80% were natural points. So what that means is um, the, the man-made points are water, um, are boreholes rather, and tanks, whereas the natural ones are just points at a given stream where people collect data and the like. So ideally, um, given the fact that these natural water sources are open, they are um, they are not protected, they have not been closed off. So this puts the people who collect water from these points at a very high risk of contracting waterborne diseases as compared to those who collect water from the man-made water points. Then functionality, we found that only 25% of the man-made water points were functional and 75% weren't. We found that 35% of the water points are actually affected by flooding. So during the rainy season, um, we find that it's very difficult for you to um, get access to some of these points, especially the man-made water points. Then we also realized that 9% of the water points actually had to part with some money. 
for you to get access to water and all this can act as a hindrance for people to be able to get access to water within the settlement. Um, next slide. Okay, yeah. So um, this slide is looking at the education facilities. Um, students, the distance students should walk from their homes to schools is often overlooked when addressing education issues. And both school, both um, location of the schools and accessibility play a very significant role in a child's ability to go to school. And a study carried out by Magad and Mingat on the impact of proximity to schools for children in sub-Saharan Africa shows that the longer the distance a child has to walk to school, the higher their likelihood of dropping out or not attending school at all. With only a 66% attendance achieved for schools at a distance between one to two kilometers from their homes. So um, looking at this slide, we decided to use a two kilometer service area and we found that only 61% were with, uh, of the dwellings in the settlement were within the service area, whereas 39% weren't when it came to the nursery schools. Then for the primary schools, 49% um, were within the service areas, 51% weren't, and then for the secondary school, it was only 5%. So um, for the secondary school in particular, it makes sense because this one secondary school that most of the students or the children, the refugees go to is actually outside the settlement, so they have to walk an even longer distance. And one of the questions that I get asked all the time is, isn't it possible for um, one of the, for these students to attend schools that are outside the settlement? And it is indeed possible. However, um, it, the education that is provided within the settlement is at a very subsidized cost. And you find that these are the schools that the refugees would rather go to in comparison to schools that are outside the settlement. Um, next slide, Dara. So these are this is for health centers. Um, according to um, the UNHCR handbook of 2019, um, the distance a distance of five kilometers is usually considered when setting up health facilities in a settlement. However, at the same time, Uganda's healthcare system works on a referral basis, such that if a given health center cannot treat or handle a case, this case is referred to another unit level up. So we have the village health teams that act as a health center one, then the health center two, health center three, health center four, then finally the um, a general hospital or a referral hospital. Within Chakato Refugee Settlement, we found that um, there's only one health center three and a health center two. And then we also found out that they have village health teams. So these are just individuals who are trained in first aid and handling simple cases and these teams usually move around the settlement to make sure that people are doing well they're not um, affected by um, certain ailments and in situations where they can't they offer aid so we found we only decided to um, do the service area analysis for the two health centers because they have trained personnel and such as clinical officers and doctors and we found that only 52% could adequately access these two these two hospitals, health centers. And again, if someone has the money, they can go to a health center outside a settlement, but this is not very common because they are very pricey as compared to the health centers that we are within the settlement. However, um, since there's a support of the village health teams within the settlement, then this sort of increases the health coverage within the settlement. Then I'd also like to make a comment about the sanitation facilities. So um, we're able to collect sanitation facilities as our toilets and latrines. However, we're only able to collect data on the public ones and not the private ones. And this, this was because people were not very comfortable with us collecting data on their properties. So however, in this setup, um, latchings, ideally, still according to UNSCR standards, they have to be at a distance of more than six meters from dwellings, and this is to prevent the transmission of diseases. However, still within the settlement, we found that um, 11 of the dwellings were actually within this distance, and this puts them at a risk of the aforementioned effect. Um, next slide, Dara. Um, so we also went a step further um, to identify possible locations where facilities could be set up for the water and the education facilities with distance as an impedance. And we also realized that um, there are very many other factors that can be taken into consideration, such as um, slope and other factors, especially when it comes to water, the groundwater table and the like, if they're setting up for a hole. So we hope that these are data sets that we can get and be able to integrate for first, be able to get um, more meaningful locations. Um, so we didn't do this for the health facilities, and this was because um, 
only one health center two is set up in um in a parish and only one health center three is set up in um sub-county so there's really not much we can do about that but the best that can be done is to sort of train the village health teams and make sure that they're able to cope with very many um ailments that the refugees might suffer from um next slide there and so we're able to do a weighted overlay analysis and we did this for the water health and education we could not include the sanitation facilities because since we were able to collect data on the public ones we didn't have a good representation of all the data so it would have it wouldn't have been a proper representation of what is on ground so we decided to use for the water for the health and education and assigned weights still for my interviews when we inquired from the refugees i mentioned that water is the most important to them followed by health and education accessibility to these facilities that's why they were awarded those weights then um for each of the facilities for example the water um we looked at the different attributes within those um facilities and also assigned weights so for example someone who has access to a man-made water point um would have better quality water compared to someone from a natural water point. Um, when it comes to the health centers, a health center three is more equipped to handle more advanced cases in comparison to a health center two. In education, we have permanent, semi-permanent, and temporary. So when we carried out the weighted overlay analysis, we realized that 10% had good access to these facilities and 65% had fair access. 23% had poor and 2% had very poor. So you'd say 75% of the dwellings within the settlement have good to fair access, whereas 25% um, have poor to very poor access. And what I would like to add is resilience is multifaceted and it can be tackled from very many different perspectives. And the, um, some of these include, for example, if we if we are to look at this particular study, we looked at um, access to social services, which is very important because this improves the quality of life of the individuals. And then also sustainability, for example, protecting and improving the environment, which was tackled under objective three of this research. And then economic vitality, social well-being, and hopefully these are avenues that will be tackled in the future. Um, next slide, Dara. Thank you very much for listening. And that's the end of my presentation. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so I'm presenting on mapping the effect of artisanal and small scale mining activities on environmental movements in Chalka Mine of Indiana. And my name is Rubina Chalka Adam, and my mentor is, is um, Dr. Anadi D. Tibu. Next slide, please, Sarah. So my topic on ASM and ASM for those of you who don't know is artisanal and small scale mining, which is the mining that is done with a minimal machinery and minimal know-how. In this part of the country, the illegal forms is termed galams. And mining is like one of the major boosters of industries across the world. And it contributes immensely to local economies of both the people living in those mining communities and outside of it. And in Ghana, ASM can only be practiced by Ghanaians who are 18 years old and have been awarded license by the Minerals Commission. The Minerals Commission is the administration that's in charge of um, everything mining in Ghana. And women and children are also the major vulnerable group in a lot of situations, and ASM is no different from this, um, those situations. So my research starts to generate open and up-to-date geographic data of my city area. Since few researchers, um, few researchers have worked on the spatial trends of social issues in ASM. Therefore, they, that created a gap in the spatial awareness of livelihood. So my research starts to generate um, open and up-to-date geographic data of the study area, and therefore, and to spatially analyze the impacts of mining activities on women and children. So women and children are the vulnerable groups that my research focused on. Next slide, please, Dara. So um, in the research, we had to get um, secondary data sets from IMCI in Ghana and uh, Menor Ghana. 
uh, IMCI in Ghana is the body that's in charge of regulating the small scale mines in Ghana, and Minerals Commission is like the total body that's in charge of overseeing everything mining. So we had to get permission from the Minerals Commission to do small scale mines. And the map shows um, the mining sites within the municipality. That's the, the ones in red are the other mining sites which are not monitored by IMCIM. And the ones in blue are the regulated mining sites or the legal mining sites. Next slide, please. Yeah. So, and looking at um, the effects, we look at a lot, a lot of indicators age, the reasons why they got into ASM, then um, the educational level and the income as well. So for the age, looking at um, the figures, we can see clearly that the majority of them um, were between the ages of 31 and 40. And a few of them were um, of other age range. Then looking at the reasons, um, a lot of them cited the um, unemployment issues in the country as the reason why they got into the ASM themselves because um, they needed to feed their families and they, they had to do something for a living. And Takwa being um, a mining community, mining was like a staple job here. So just they didn't have an option but to do that. And um, for the educational level, uh, some of them had no educational background. Some of them, majority of them saw that secondary school level. And um, the rest of them had um, primary education and other basic education. So now, when we come to the income, it would be interesting to note that um, the males um, responded that they earned 250 Ghana cities to 650 Ghana cities. That is um, $48 to $125 per month. And the women earned 50 Ghana cities to 280 Ghana cities, which is $28. To fifty-three dollars a month, and we can clearly see how much there's a gap in uh, that particular earning for women to end like very less. This shows like a very visible trend of how women end less in certain industries. Next slide, please. So now, um, one of the indicators was the ownership. And this map shows like, this is the regulated uh, mines that uh, we can get data on. The other mines are not regulated, so getting data on them is very hard, but the IMCIM regulated mines should, um, is provided on this map. And you can see that 67% um, of the mines were owned fully by males. That is the one in blue. Then 25% were owned partly by females. That is the ones um, in black. And just 8% um, is, uh, are the ones that were fully owned by females, which is shown in red. And that is very worrying since um, female ownership or female participation only account for 33% of the entire um, uh, participation in mines in the municipality. Next slide. Yeah. So now, um, what we did was um, the effects that we got in were coded into five main um, sectors that are uh, using the multivariate factory tool. And uh, uh, some of the respondents uh, did say that they had experienced no effect whatsoever from working in the mines. But um, so that wasn't added in the table since it experienced no um, uh, effects. There's really no point to add it to the table. So the remaining four was the hazards and the rates, the diseases and disorders, the chemically related factors and the social related factors. So the hazards and the rates had the rock falls, the poor ventilation systems, the atmospheric conditions on the ground, and the sensitivity to violence or abuse on this um, sites. Then the disease and disorders, we had the respiratory disorders, the body aches, the hearing problem, the eye defects, and what we needed. And the chemically related factors, mercury and cyanide poison. And usually, from those who work in the processing plants, um, mercury is used in the amalgamation of gold. And uh, you can see how mercury and water, that reaction with it causes mercury poisoning. And lots of the time, 
it does damages to your system like little by little before you realize like it has done a lot of damage to your system. They had lead and aluminum, who are naturally occurring elements that are hazardous in mind. And there's social related factors. Like one major thing that the women cited was that they didn't have um, social security or health security. So whatever um, injuries they sustained at this particular um, site, their bosses were not held liable for it. And they also the money that they earned, um, they are going to use it to take care of their family. So there's there's not enough for them to even say they are going to use it to um, check on their health or anything. And there were no standards for their wages. As you can clearly see, the men were pay, paid more than them, right? and quite a substantial amount that the men were paid more than the women. Uh, um, they are working hours were monitored and defined. They didn't have particular structures. This is oh, you come to work at 7 a.m., they close at 5 p.m., and this is where you're paid at the end of the month. They were paid um, on the uh, will or whims of what their bosses wanted. Next. So this is taking a closer look at Takwa Town itself. And um, we just, uh, looking at the Takwa Town itself, we coded the effect and then from the maps, you can clearly see that the disease and disorders were the effects that a lot of these women cited as being the most prevalent. And um, followed closely by the hazards and risks. So you can see that um, a lot of the women faced um, diseases and disorders. But unfortunately, they didn't have, since they complained of having no social um, or security or health security, they, there's nothing they can do about their health. And um, healthcare in this country, even though it's subsidized, there are some particular parts, um, health conditions that are not catered for. And such um, health conditions are not catered for. So in essence, your health insurance doesn't cover that part. And it's more or less not going to help you in that situation. Next slide. Yeah, and um, before that, um, before we started the whole process, um, we had um, a, a initial reconnaissance survey where we looked at, I uh, went around the municipality and we looked at the place where mining was taking place. Then we got um, the locations of those places. And that was during the time that there was a ban on it. Then after the ban was lifted, we now went on further to have um, our um, field survey. And a lot of uh, mines at that time were now being utilized in this way because after the ban has been lifted. So the study concluded that the fact that we didn't see any child during the data collection stage is a good indicator that the ban may have to a large extent left this purposes. But we can only verify that after some time. Next slide. Yes. So another interesting thing to notice, um, before we went to the field, we were quite optimistic that we get a lot of responses. But then when we got to the field, we realized that um, human engagement and human subjects are not always going to act um, the way that we want them to. A lot of people didn't want to speak to us. Maybe it may have been because of the ban that was placed on them, or just um, individual uh, wishes, they, they, a lot of them felt threatened, even though we tried to explain to them that it's just like purely for academic purposes. They didn't want to speak to us, so we had no choice but not to get any response from them. And a lot of them who even gave responses, um, uh, who gave us responses, gave them on the condition that um, they should they not be recorded, per se. So, at the end of the day, we expected to get like very large data sets, but because of um, the lack of responses and then the conditions and everything, we didn't get as much um, data sets as we wanted to. So uh, I'd say that next time, I, this would be a great lesson, but especially when we're working with human subjects, we don't expect a lot since um, people are likely to change their mind a lot of things. So it's better to structure your work around um, the factors that uh, you can easily define and rather not the human subject. Next slide. Thank you for listening. If there are any questions. <laughs>
So I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you so much. We're going to go back to Chamba and hopefully the connectivity um, has been resolved. So he'll be able to present. And we'll have the question and answer right after his presentation, everyone. Okay, uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to present on uh, something that is very, I think that's gathering uh, for everything and uh, not only for the research fellows, but for everyone. Um, lack of use of words and academic research. So before I go further, I just I just want to tell everyone on uh, what I was uh, looking at on my research. I was, um, the topic was using operation map. Uh, to map the instances of malaria among vulnerable people in one of the districts, one of the districts, uh, um, which is a, a little district in Zambia. Unfortunately, I'm not going to talk much about it. So my focus will be the the, the, the lack of person uh, using our uh, academic research. Uh, yes. Uh, next step, slide. Okay. So one thing that um, um, that has come up is. Um, there is too much uh, skepticism for the use of RSM. Uh, this is coming from uh, seeing that um, it is a free editable um, uh, map or week. So a lot of uh, people that have been asking, um, they are saying um, they are not sure of the data that we are adding to. Uh, if, if that data is a real data, so there is a lot of uh, questions when it comes to the quality of the data. So uh, it's very important that you have seen that recently most of uh, our data have been uh, called for validation, which is very important now, so that um, we have uh, a very genuine data. So I encourage everyone here to make sure that um, as much as we are mapping, uh, make sure also take part into uh, validation, especially when it comes to the locals uh, your, in your countries, because most of the time we map other areas where we have not been to. So, you people, we are in that country where you are from. It is very, very important that you take a uh, keen interest in making sure that uh, you validate the data so that everyone can be sure to say this data, if I'm going to use it in academic research, it's a good data, it's a real data. Um, for example, if I can map something that is in uh, Uganda and I've never been to Uganda, uh, I might uh, uh, put something wrong or not uh, actual of the data. So I guess from Uganda or guess from Malawi or any other part of the world should make sure that uh, if uh, we are mapping a project uh, or in OSM in their country, make sure that they do a lot of validation because they are the locals to reduce on this uh, skepticism that is there. Okay, um, this is again uh, the issue. Uh, less people know about OSM datasets. Um, if we can just take a survey here, we are only people who understand about OSM and um, youth mappers all about. But um, it's not only, I think OSM data set cannot only work for the people that are within us. We also need to make sure that other people uh, understand about data set. So uh, there is a need of integrating even um, OSM into the curriculum. If it was integrated in different universities and colleges into the curriculum, I think a lot of people will uh, know because even OSM is, I think, uh, more cheaper and more user friendly uh, that can be used in our academic research. Um, up to now, I can give you an example. In my university, a lot of people are still using the old technology of paper per week, for example, in terms of collecting um, data. Uh, very few people know about uh, uh, tools like Combo2 Collector or DK, all those um, tools which are open. So if um, we advocate or um, we push that um, these kind of tools be introduced and taught into curriculum into various, uh, in, in various universities, then uh, that skepticism and that um, lack uh, will be uh, shortened. Next. Okay, um, traditional mapping in OSM. Uh, what it means is that uh, when OSM started, um, it was just focusing on uh, mapping the roads and the buildings only. But now we have seen that um, 
things have changed or when it comes to um, academic research, different people, are, uh, different students are researching different topics. So someone told, uh, was telling me, to, uh, but most of the time, the data that you guys produce, it's only to do with frauds and um, buildings. Um, I think th uh, three weeks ago, he was looking for farming zones um, in Zambia. And then so I was trying to look at it in OSM, and then unfortunately, there was nothing like that. So it's high time that I'll challenge the youth mappers around the world uh, there to say, it's high time that we start thinking or mapping beyond uh, the building and the roads so that we have a rich data. So if we have uh, data that is very rich, I think even the popularity of OSM will be there. A lot of people are going to use OSM because the richness of data is just beyond the roads and the, um, the buildings that we map most of the time. So there is a need, um, youth mappers, we can come up with a lot of projects, maybe even other researches, so that we uh, have a broad of, um, range of different types of data. Yeah, uh, next. I think uh, that was my slide. Thank you very much. Uh, any question? Okay. Um, thank you so much for to the research fellows for sharing with us uh, on your projects and your and your work that you're doing and have done before. Uh, so since we are way beyond time, we'll just give it a few minutes. If anyone has any questions, you can. Um, go ahead and type that on the chat section, or you can go ahead and then mute yourself and just ask the question directly. Yeah, if, also if you have a comment or something to say to the presenters, you can go ahead and do that. So it'll give us say uh, like five minutes and then we can close. Hello everyone. Hi. Uh, this is Kennedy. I just had uh, I just had the question concerning all the presentations that were done. I've uh, really enjoyed the presentations, and uh, hopefully, whatever that is being done, we we'll actually see the result at the end of the day. Uh, just a few comments before I ask my question, because it's a it's a request from everyone that was presenting. Uh, just a comment on what, what Tomba was from presenting earlier. I think it's uh, it's very true, and I say it's very true because I remember the time we were involved in a, a project uh, that Hot was doing, and we were using data that was uh, being mapped by youth mappers all over the world, and we had a problem to to access certain data when we were in the field when we were doing the actual the actual mapping. So I think it's a good initiative that we we engage not only mapping roads and uh, buildings. And then coming back to my request, I don't know, is it uh, okay if uh, the, uh, the presentations that were being done can be shared? I don't know if it's okay with them, if data that they were sharing can be shared to, to some of us that were listening so that we can uh, basically read more about it. Yeah, sure. Um, the the session is also being recorded, so after after this webinar, uh, this will be uploaded, and then I guess Dara will also share with us the slides that were used for for this presentation. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you too for your for your comments. Uh, you could also look into some work that has been done by. Um, someone called David Garcia uh, on social media, he's called the map maker. He mainly talks a lot on, he calls it the Ministry of Mapping and he basically talks a lot about uh, mapping and access and including local communities. Uh, so Yo, I, I, more, yeah, yeah, yeah I, think I've, uh, I think I've seen him. I've seen, I've seen his works on Twitter. Yeah, I think uh, I've, seen, I've seen what he's been doing. Ah, cool, amazing. 
And I don't, does anyone else have a question or a comment as well? Um, yeah, you can go ahead and then mute yourself if you have any question or comment. Um, Everyone is very shy. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Mute, let's interrupt. Hello, everyone. Hi. Yeah, it's um, Andy. Hello, please, can you hear me? Yes, we, yes can. we can. Yeah, so I think one of the presentations, I realized that uh, women and men were not paid accordingly. Like, there was a gap between the payment of both sexes. So I really don't know, I really don't know the problem over there, but it's as if there is some bias, something over there. So in, in as much as we are moving forward, let's let's come together to bridge that gap because I believe everyone has his or her own strengths and weaknesses. So it shouldn't be that uh, maybe the women who do most of the work, men also do most of the work, but the men are being paid the more. So let's let's come together and just bridge that gap. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, and, sorry. Okay. Yes, and that's a very good point. And it wasn't just the payments. The it was also another thing altogether. And um, funny enough, they didn't have any valid reason as why the women were paid less. They just know that that's how it has always been. So. They really have a reason why. Sure, sure. So I just I just made that uh, observation and decided to comment about it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Okay. I am Tommy from um SJ Youth Mappers. The question I want to ask is this: I'm um, looking at the presentations I I I I, I saw. Um, I saw very good maps. Um, that 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 we are um, well designed and also and some data analytics. So what I want to ask is: um, were those maps? Um, did did um do the cause of the research fail? Um, did um recipients or researchers get um technical skills or training from youth map from youth mappers or they got from both youth mappers and their mentors. And is it possible that um with such maps is it possible for participants of the research fellow um the research fellows to share their skills and knowledge on a platform that will benefit all youth mappers around the world? Uh, so I, I think each of the each of the presenters could go ahead and share um, uh, about the <laughs> like what these skills taught through the through through the fellowship or what these technical skills that you had acquired through school, and also if you'd be willing to be contacted by some of the attendees here for like to share your expertise or to give guidance uh, in terms of like making maps and doing the analytics. So uh, we could start with Irene. Irene, are you there? Um, I think she's not there. Um, Michael? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes. I think I think is a good point. Um, I think that those research projects uh, uh, were born uh, like uh, on the other way around. Uh, like uh, we were thinking about our technical competencies, and then we were thinking how to apply these competencies to our research projects. So yes, I think uh, is I mean for the analytical stuff, I think is uh, very difficult if you are not. Uh, uh, taking maybe a, a university course because uh, it's like a lot of years uh, of studying analytics and then applying them in a, for a for a research project. But for sure, we can give uh, guidance. Uh, I mean, I'm available, and I think uh, everyone 
can share their competencies and give uh, guidance uh, on some particular uh, topics. Um, what about you, Ingrid? Uh, Ingrid, are you there? Yes, I am. Um, what I can say, it's it's pretty much similar to what um, Mikhail has said, but then also we had a really good training. Um, there was before we embarked on this learning to do um, this research and do all these amazing things. So that was also very helpful. Then also, um, okay, for me, um, it was a bit easier because this is sort of like my background, dramatics, JS and remote sensing. But um, there are very many resources out there, very many YouTube videos, very many things that you can look up and learn how to do these things. It's not very difficult. And there's also some um, online courses on cartography and things like that, if anyone is interested. And it, when it comes to um, getting help from me personally, I really don't have a problem with it. I should add my email if someone has a question or they'd like to know how I did something or how to do other things GIS related, I'm available to help. Thank you. Great. Um, Irene, um, Chalpang, Chomba, do you have any other comments uh, regarding uh, technical skills? and if you're available uh, to be contacted regarding your yeah, project. Um, all right, um, thank you for that question. Uh, first of all, um, the goodness about um, the fellowship or uh, research is um, they're going to, to be taught um, most of the, the works and uh, what you can be doing during the research or how should be, how the research should be done. Um, and then uh, I'm available also to help uh, each and every person that is out there. I've also uh, put my email on the, the chat. I'll be very glad to to help anyone that wants any uh, help because we are one family. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I guess all all the research fellows are available to answer any questions uh, regarding their maps, their projects, their presentations, and They've even dropped their email addresses on the chat section. Uh, also, you could check out the Youth Mappers Twitter, Facebook pages, and you'll see they were tagged in the uh, in the posts where we were announcing this webinar. So you could also contact them via via Twitter or Facebook. Uh, is there any other question? I think we can take one last one, and then we could call it a session. Okay, um, since there are not any, there are no other questions, I uh, think I'll go ahead and thank the research fellows for accepting to share with us about their projects and their work on, on very last minute. Um, thank you so much for sharing with us, for taking your time to prepare for for this session, uh, I guess we've all been inspired by the work that you've done, and uh, at least even from even what Chomba said, uh, I guess this will even motivate us to look beyond adding buildings and and roads on the set. Like TS will continue adding this on the same as, as they're still essential in our in our analysis and everything that we do. But we've also been motivated to see the other ways that we could include other data sets to OSM and how we could use it uh, specifically for scientific and academic research. So thank you, thank you very much. We really appreciate uh, the time that you've taken to share with us your work. Aya uh, and your presentations are really amazing, even based on the comments that people have been sharing on the chat as you're presenting. Um, also, thank you so much to Dara and Marcella for helping us to organize this and putting everything together um, for us to be able to meet today. So um, for, as I'd share that after this, uh, the team from Mapas that is Dara will, will work on the webinar. So this will be, this has been recorded and will be shared with everyone. Uh, I think same to the 
presentation slides. Uh, I think all those who registered will receive uh, a copy of this. Um, yeah, so, uh, but for other webinars that you might have missed, uh, this was the seventh one. So you could find that you can find them on on YouTube uh, under the Youth Mappers YouTube channel. Um, yeah, so that's it from me. I guess we could call it a, a day. Um, have a good evening, afternoon, uh, a good night, a good morning from wherever you're joining us today. And we hope to see you uh, on the next one. Thank you so much.